Hey, Danny, can you hear me? Hey, everybody. Sorry for the delay on my end. No worries. How's the getting audio? Some, Hopefully the getting some good. quality quality family time. Yeah, we had some um, we had some relatives in town over the weekend, so I came here and I just haven't left. You know, they're feeding me too good over here. <laughs> You're gonna have to postpone your fitness uh, episodes till maybe maybe January. You know, because you'll be eating some good Indian food. Well, I'm, I said starting December 12th, that's two months away from my 29th birthday. I'm, yeah. I'm getting a meal prep company because I don't really cook. I mean, I can cook mm -hmm. you know, up some stuff for breakfast. Yeah. I could cook if I really wanted, but mm -hmm. at the time, the dishes, not my thing, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, I hear you. Well, look, man, thanks for coming. Um, it's great to see you. You know, I, I've been kind of following you on TikTok and I just love your brand, you know, but you've taken your career to new heights and you've evolved as a person and with your career, but let's talk about just where you started, right? So you worked in private equity, you worked in banking. I'm still in New York. You used to be in New York, right? And, um, you know, tell me that experience, tell me the lifestyle that you had. And then, you know, you're one of those people that went through the great resignation, right? So <laughs> like, you're like, fuck it. I'm just, I'm done. Like, I'm going to do my own thing. Um, I'm going to focus on, focus on the next chapter of my life. Right. So let's go deep on that. So let's talk about where you went to school, what you studied, where you grew up. Um, you know, I would say, you know, we're both from Florida. So I would say with me, when I was in Florida, I didn't even know what private equity and venture was. Like I had one uncle that did his master's in engineering. And I thought that was kind of the, that that's like when you make it right. And then I went to yeah. New York I went to New York for a weekend, met some buddies that were working in PE and VC, and then that's when I got exposed to the industry. But, you know, tell me about just your journey, start out with school, how you grew up, and then how you broke into PE and how you even found out about it. And then let's just unpack all that. Yeah, absolutely. It's a little bit of a, a long story, but so I'm, I'm born and raised in Miami, Florida, and Growing up, I wouldn't say I was very entrepreneurial, but I definitely liked making money. Um, so my first job was the cook at Kentucky Fried Chicken in high school, did that for three months. And I was like, this is not what I want to do. So anyway, I played football for a long time. And my senior year of high school, as I was thinking about where to go to school, you know, I knew I didn't want to get into the medical field just because of the amount of schooling required. So I had an idea that I wanted to pursue something in, in business. Didn't know anything about finance, because like you, you know, didn't really have any relatives working in, in finance. So, you know, I, I just knew that the, if I could get to the best school possible, that would help me get the highest paying job possible. So I went to the University of Chicago where I studied economics. Um, I also was recruited to play football there. So I did that for two years. Uh, and when I got there, I noticed that probably 50, 60 percent of my teammates were getting into finance. And there were a lot of upperclassmen who were interning at investment banks or who had locked up job offers on Wall Street. And obviously, they're telling me about how lucrative it can be. And that immediately caught my attention. So, you know, I joined the investment club on campus, started networking with a lot of people. And I said, you know, why not? Let me give it a shot. I did an investment banking internship after my sophomore year of college. And that really set me up well for recruiting from, you know, my junior year internship. And long story short, I ended up interning at a city group and then joining them full time in their media and telecommunications group in New York after graduating in uh, 2016. And then I did that for a year, but, you know, I knew I wanted to. So I guess after my, for, after I locked that job up, you know, I knew that banking was almost like a two year graduate yeah. degree either prep and can you daughter. walk you know some of the people here in this audience are looking to break into pe and vc so we have this you know program and a community that kind of embraces that but maybe you can shed some light on what you had to go through to land the role like what are obviously you know nothing that's proprietary but just kind of in general what are the skills that you need to have to kind of land that pe uh or banking job you know they're you know you need to do uh, a lot of financial modeling, you got to do DCF, you know, what, what are kind of the hard skills? And then I would say, what are the soft skills that um, helped you land that job? 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. I would say first, just to get to banking, right? The hardest mm-hmm. part, in my opinion, is getting the interview or getting interviews with these investment banks because mm-hmm. they just get so many applicants and they only recruit at a handful of schools, right? Mm-hmm. So for me, I was fortunate that they U Chicago was a target school for almost every investment bank, but they also had the Booth School of Business. So there were a lot of alumni from that working on Wall Street. So I did a lot of networking. Mm-hmm. I actually started scheduling calls with people at every bank I was interested in a year before recruiting and interview started. So from my sophomore year of college, I was doing like three to four, 30 to 45 minute networking calls a week. Because when I was in college, recruiting for the junior year internship happened around December, January of your junior year. So I was doing it about eight months in advance. But now the timeline has moved up even more from that. So you have to start even earlier. So, you know, it's it's unfortunate because people who didn't don't know much about investment banking or don't have the industry connects. You don't really know what it is your freshman year of college, but things happen so quickly now. You have to land a great internship after your freshman year of college. You have to join the investment club your freshman year and because recruiting now happens your sophomore year of college. But I would say networking is the most important thing because if you get on people's radar, you can hopefully get on the short list for an interview. Once you're selected for an interview, you know, there's, I used a lot of Wall Street prep guides and training the street guides. They have, you know, separate guides on accounting, DCFs, leveraged buyouts, um, you know, general valuation guides. They have like 200 and 400 question guides. That'll help prepare you for the technical portion of the interview. And, you know, some banks interviews are more technical with the questions than others, whereas other banks are more like the three questions you're always going to get in a banking interview are like, tell me about yourself or walk me through your resume. That's one. Number two, you know, why did you decide? Why do you want to work in investment banking? And, and number three, why do you want to work at our investment bank? Like those are the three you're almost always going to get in every banking interview. But then after that portion of the interview, which will take up 10 to 15 minutes, it could go into a technical direction or they can ask some more behavioral or fit questions you know, ask general market questions. But usually the way a banking interview process works is you have either a first round 30 minute phone screen or a first round, if you're a target school, 30 minute interview on campus. From there, you'll go into a second round, 30 minute phone screen or interview. And then you'll get invited to a super day, which is like a four to six hour session of like like six to eight back to back 30 minute interviews. So, so that will you'll meet with multiple members of the of the team or the specific group you're interviewing with. And then from there, you'll get an offer. Now, some of the more technical investment banks probably give modeling tests now, maybe or very easy valuation exercises in Microsoft Excel. But most I don't think do that. I mean, I've been <laughs> it's been a couple of years now since I've you know been involved in the banking recruiting process. So that's what I'll say about banking. Now, for private equity. Um, you know, before the typical path was you'll do your two years of banking and then you'll start recruiting for private equity at the end of your first year of investment banking. And you'll lock that job up around that time. And then you'll do your last year of banking and then start your two year private equity role. But the industry is changing. And like I said, the timeline's moving up for everything. So some of the big private equity firms like Blackstone, KKR, Carlisle, they're recruiting people right out of college for analyst positions now, right? Because typically you join as an, from an investment banking analyst to, to becoming a private equity associate for two years. Now they're just handle, uh, hiring some, some of them are hiring analysts right out of college for a two-year analyst program. Then yeah. if you're good, they'll, you know, promote you to a two-year associate program. Mm-hmm. And then the typical path was go get an MBA for two years. If you're really good, they'll invite you back as a senior associate. Um, And if not, you'll interview for other PE roles post MBA, assuming you want to stay in the industry and hedge funds are somewhat similar for the most part. Um, But now there's still a handful of PE firms that recruit banking analysts, but the interviews happen like within three to four months of starting your job. You don't really have deals to talk about, right? So what you really, what they really evaluate you on is like what school you went to, your test scores, your GPA, the, uh, how prestigious the bank is and the group within the bank you're, are, you're at. Yeah. Um, and then obviously they'll still give you a modeling exam and ask you technical questions. But in terms of 
hiring investment bankers based on their M&A deal experience. Mm -hmm. That's not, there's not too much of that happening these days. So for me, you know, once I joined, so I did Citigroup TMT for a year, then went to a boutique investment bank called Mollison Company, where I was more of a generalist and they worked with more lower middle market companies. So think companies kind of in that 10 to 30 million of EBITDA range. Um, I knew I wanted to work in that portion of private equity, mm -hmm. especially because I wanted to move back to South Florida and all the P big PE firms in South Florida do lower middle market private equity for the most part. So moving over to Molas helped me get that deal experience as well as the brand name on my resume that helped me lock up a private equity job um, in South Florida in 2018. So I did that. Uh, what about the career pivoters, right? So somebody that has been working in banking for some time. So what, what do you what, what advice do you give to people that um, are trying to switch into PE uh, later in their career? Maybe they've been doing banking for a while. And then what about somebody that has no PE background at all, right? And they're trying to just pivot from like tech or from like marketing or something like that. Like, what would you recommend those people to do? Yeah, so I think- It'll vary depending on if you're an investment banker or other mm -hmm. finance corp dev professional versus yeah. like a tech or tech person or marketing or, you know, a more unrelated industry. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if you're in tech and you want to move into finance, you know, the typical path would be um, going to get an MBA from like a, what is it, top seven MBA program or mm -hmm. top 10, you know, Definitely, if you go to a place like Harvard, Wharton, Booth, Columbia, a few other ones, all the investment banks recruit associates um, for after their MBA. Yeah. So that would be probably the most direct and shortest yeah. path to get into finance. So that's one path to do a full-time MBA, like an Ivy full -time MBA. Yeah. But if you're in tech, um, if you network with enough people, you mm -hmm. have some college friends who are in investment banking and yeah. they help you get up to speed and prepped on why you want mm -hmm. to make pivot. I w it's not impossible, but I will say it's, it's, it's very competitive for these yeah. associate roles or even analyst roles, right? They're all filled out of college. So if you have a completely unrelated um, work experience, you're going to need some, a lot of prep and heavy industry connections and networking to try to break into one of those roles. Yeah, but I wouldn't say it's impossible, but mm -hmm. it's um, it's gonna be it's gonna be pretty yeah. tough. It might be easier, like if you're in tech, to start networking with people in the technology group. Yeah, like the um, fintech yeah. fintech sectors and exactly. And kinda, yeah, and you might you might not go directly to Goldman Sachs. You might start at like BMO Capital Markets or mm -hmm. a smaller a smaller investment bank or a more yeah. regional investment bank. Get a year of work experience there. Mm -hmm. Then lateraling to a bigger bank in New York or Chicago or wherever you want to go would be easier. The key thing is if you're in an unrelated industry, get your foot into an investment bank and get that experience. Because yeah. that saves you the trouble and the worry yeah. on the on the investment bank's end of like why you want to yeah. be thinking, right? Because there's so much sure. turn in the industry and they're always worried that someone coming in doesn't really know what they're getting themselves mm -hmm. into because it's still 80, could be 80 to hundred hour work weeks. Right. Yeah. And yeah. And I've seen some people that like, you know, they work in marketing or they work in tech or it and, you know, they end up landing a job at Goldman just doing it stuff. Right. But sometimes I think Goldman or some of these firms, they'll pay for, you know, they'll pay for your continuing education. So you could do a CFA or something like that. And then to your point, maybe take a lateral move as like an analyst or an associate um, in, in that certain team, but you came in from a different group, but at least you're at the bank, right? So you're at Goldman doing IT, but then maybe there's an opening and you built a, and it's networking, right? So you built a relationship with that manager exactly. uh, on the side, you did your CFA. So you kind of built equity in yourself with the education. So what I'm hearing is, and feel free to help me out here, but it's a combination of learning part-time, but then also really just building relationships. Yeah, that's right. So if you're like yeah. in, at a tech company, yeah, you mm -hmm. could also move over to like the IT department of an investment bank. Yeah. Do that for one to two years. If you network with people internally, establish the right connections. Most banks are pretty good about mobility within the mm -hmm. department and within the bank. So that's actually probably yeah. another good way to do it. So yeah. you got the MBA route, joining a lower tier, smaller investment bank, um, or then joining a 
department at a big investment bank related to your current work experience or sector. Now, if you're already in investment banking and you want to move to private equity once you're an associate or a VP, mm -hmm. I would say that's very possible because you're going to have, you're going to know, you're, you should know plenty of people in private equity and some of your former analysts will work in private equity. So as long as you have a, the, the, the skill set, the technical skill set, you should be able to network with these PE firms to at least get interviews the next time they're recruiting if you're an associate at an investment bank. Once you get to kind of the VP level though, and especially if you already have an MBA, it's a little tougher at these bigger private equity firms because most of them are still in kind of that, do your two years as a PE associate and then go get yeah. an MBA. Yeah, there's a whole culture where you have to kind of follow the chain of command and then you gotta kind of put your time in, right? You gotta earn earn those stripes. Cause some of those other people that have been in Goldman, they've been there for like 20 years, right? And they're they're managing directors. So they don't they don't want somebody to come in and try to try to become a man and an MD in like three to four years, right? They want you to put in your time. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And though I mean, I'm assuming what happens, I mean, this is the same thing in tech. You know, you're at Goldman and maybe you do your MBA, but you're not getting paid enough. So what do you do? You just go across the street and go to JP Morgan or go to Barclays to try to get a, maybe a title or salary bump. Is that kind of a common thing in PE and, and banking? Um, well, at least with banking, when you're kind of at the associate VP level, you know, there is a range that most salaries that's normal for the street for most banks, right? Yeah. So it's hard to leverage salary too much. Mm -hmm. uh, from bank to bank because they all know it's within a pretty I wouldn't say narrow range but there's like you know if you're a second year associate the range of salary you should be making if they really if a bank really really likes you and wants you wants you maybe you can like negotiate for an extra 20 to you know 40k but I would say once you get to the managing director level and you're responsible for bringing in deal flow that's where you have more leverage and you know can bump your salary but most banks right because they want to retain talent they've already given everybody pay raises they've already yeah. improved the hours and work-life balance for most junior bankers yeah so obviously some places are worse than others like mm -hmm. Mold and lazard are you know back when i was doing banking were like the sweatshops <laughs> right and no matter what investment bank you go to if you're in a great group and you're on a billion dollar m a deal you're going to be yeah. putting in crazy hours but in general, the most banks have tried to, you know, improve work-life balance in some regard, mm -hmm. whether it's one or two protected days a, a month or Citigroup when I was there, analysts and associates didn't work on Saturdays. You needed a special yeah. approval. So most banks have done things to improve pay and work-life mm -hmm. balance, improve retention. But you may be able to jump ship every now and then, but you don't want to do it too often because that sends a bad signal as well to, to the banks. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of these programs like point 72, a lot of the quant funds they're they're building like these really cool educational programs where you can kind of learn for two years and you get a mentor. Um, I think Stephen Cohen was at the salt conference. So he was talking about that. So that was really interesting. Just kind of their whole process for like retaining talent and, and all that kind of stuff. So it was really cool. Um, yeah. So tell me what happened next. So you're working in banking, you're doing really well, uh, you know, working, you know, it seems like your hours are getting better, right? So then what happened after that? It seemed like you yeah. had a good gig. Yeah, no, I had a good gig. So I always knew I was going to leave banking and go into private yeah. equity. So 2018, mm -hmm. I, I joined a private equity firm uh, in Miami mm -hmm. uh, or West, West Palm Beach. That was, yeah. look, private equity was way more interesting. Overall, yeah. the hours were more better. That first firm was, it's the thing is, it was a little more there was a steeper learning curve and it was more mm -hmm. high pressure Yeah, because in banking, right? You always have two people above you checking your work, catching mistakes. Whereas when you're at a lower middle market, private equity firm, it's you, it's like a three person deal team basically. Mm -hmm. And the number, yeah. now the numbers actually matter, right? Because you're, you're deploying millions of dollars of capital based on your analysis. So yeah. it was more high pressure, but overall the hours were better. The schedule was more flexible. And the work was much more interesting. I was at a firm called Atlantic Street Capital for a year, had a great experience, closed two platform acquisitions and I think two add-on acquisitions. But a firm I had been talking with for a few years finally decided to hire their second associate in 2019 
fortunately, so I was able to land that role with them after interviewing. It's an ex HIG Capital spin out called Hidden Harbor Capital Partners. I joined them in April and it was awesome. Like I loved yeah. it. You know, it was basically their fifth investment professional that they hired, not including, or sixth, if you include everyone. It would have been a non MBA role. I actually got lunch with them yesterday to catch on Monday to catch up. It was awesome. And that was going really well. And then, you know, COVID hit. And, you know, taking a step back from the ages of 18 to at this point, I was 27. I had never had a chance to explore any other interests because going down this banking private equity route, it's so defined and structured. There's a very structured linear path to get there. So for me, my mindset was, okay, I'm going to do this for two years, go to the next role, get the pay I want to get. And up until I was 27, I thought I was going to be at Hidden Harbor until I was 35, making sure. millions of dollars a year, be a partner there, which I was on that track. But then during COVID, working from home, deal flow, deal flow was slow. I just realized, like, I liked making content because I had obviously gained, I had gained a lot of weight during banking. Yeah. I wanted to lose it all, get back in really good shape. So I was Did it get better with private equity, though? Because the hours are better, right? Yeah, yeah, the hours were, yeah. especially at Hidden Harbor, the hours yeah. were, like, like, to give you a range, I would say from the ages of 23 to 25, I was working on average 80 to 100 hours a week. Yeah. From 25 to 26. So my first year in PE was pretty rough, too. I would say I was working about 70 hours a week. Mm-hmm. 26, probably working 60 hours a week. And then that mm-hmm. year during COVID, I was probably in that 60 hour a week range. You know, what's funny, though, I joke about this because, uh, you know, I'm an entrepreneur myself and I have a couple of businesses, but you know, you're working the same amount of hours, right? Or more, right? I'm probably working hundred hour weeks, but you're doing stuff that, you know, so you can either like work for somebody else and have a nine to five, or you can just work for yourself and just work for, you know, all, all day, every day. Right. But right. at least if you're doing something that you like, then I guess it's okay. So for me, I like what I do. So it's all right, you know, um, yeah. but you could take the nine to five and really just be a robot and kind of just check in and check out. Right. And not really be happy with what you do. Right. So, exactly. um, exactly. so I want to call that out. So, you know, the, the, you know, COVID hit not so many deals, but you're not, you know, at risk to get fired, you know, but you enjoyed right. creating content. So then, then what, what else is going on through your head? Yeah. So I'm posting fitness content on Instagram. People are like, yo, that's super inspirational. Like, yeah. keep posting. like, okay, I like making content. Then. Yeah. You had some inspirational videos too, right. About confidence and motivation yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Um, So then on top of that, you know, in March of 2020, I wanted to diversify and start, I had money to start investing now after working Mm -hmm. for a couple of years and more time. So I had an eight unit multifamily building under contract in Miami. Then the stock market crashed because of COVID. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, like the cash on cash return for that multifamily was like 12%. 3X, yeah. Yeah, no, 12%. Not even 3X, yeah, okay. And then when the market crashed, I was like, all right, there's going to be some opportunities here. Yeah. And I had never explored investing in public equities because to be honest, growing up, I didn't think it was something the average person could do. Yeah. And and I mean, our parents probably, you know, said it was super risky to like, look, you know, just put money, put money in your savings account and, and invest in your 401k. Exactly. So I had no precedent to try that. And then remember things like Robin hood didn't exist. So yeah. I, it was harder for a smaller retail investor to learn about the market and make trades without like, if I trade like I do today, 10 years ago, I would have been paying like three grand a month in commissions. Yeah. You know, so, but we'll get into that. So mm-hmm. I had all this money and I said, all right, I saw airline and cruise stocks just crash. And I was like, all right, there's no way all of these are going bankrupt. Yeah. So basically the way I thought about it was So what happened? Did somebody bail them out? So like, you know, during COVID, all the cruise lines and airlines, they obviously the, them, the the yeah, price most tanked. Got, yeah, most the, of them got government assistance yeah, in France. But sure. I basically maxed out every credit card I had, took out every personal loan I could take, and took all my savings and put it in two cruise lines and two airlines. Yeah. That's conviction. And, yeah, yeah. I did I definitely did some homework, but I like I, the way I viewed it from a risk reward standpoint yeah. was like, if this all goes to shit, I lose one year worth of my salary Yeah, I'm making almost a quarter million dollars in private equity. So I was like, it's not the end of the world. And mm-hmm. I was like, if it goes well, I'm going to make a ton of money and yeah. really get myself on a little better footing than I already was. So anyway, 
the market did rebound. All turns out I wasn't that smart. All airlines and cruise lines went up a ton. But um, so you know, did you I short realized, them or did you, no, you just bought? I you went, went along. Okay, got it. So you I did okay. Bought, so you did well, right? You crushed it because it was yeah. I bought it. Yeah. The week Warren Buffett sold all his airlines mm -hmm. was when I went big on the airlines. Oh, okay, so you were a little. Oh, he's okay. So you sold when he sold is what you're so, saying. So when he sold, they went to like ten year lows. Oh wow! And that's okay. that's when I went in. That's when you went in. Yeah. That's when I went in. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, I made like a three hundred percent return in 2020, and I realized shit. I kind of like investing in public equities, especially being an athlete my whole life. You know, I loved that for my emotional temperament and like that daily P and L you get from trading. I I just realized I enjoy that more than private equity. Yeah. Private equity is a three to seven year value creation process. Mm -hmm. You got to lay a brick by brick every single day, whether it's hiring a new employee at the portfolio company, yeah. helping them improve their monthly financial reporting process or helping them craft a deck to win a large new customer. It was just a very slow value creation. Mm -hmm. process. Yeah. So I realized I like public equities because of the liquidity. I can get in and out. Yeah. And I'm That's the beauty of it. So I think, you know, what you and I were chatting about this, you know, I believe this is just my belief. And we're already seeing this with crossover funds, right? So every fund in the future is going to invest in venture and publics. And I feel like some of the style of how we invest in venture, right? So with venture, you're, you're, you, you have the opportunity to get liquidity if you, if, you, um, if, you sell, if you sell some of your pro rata shares, right? You can kind of sell that out and you know, create an SPV. You also have... Um, you also have other opportunities to sell secondaries, right? So, so a lot of those functions are creating some liquid exit points for private, right? So I think you can, that does converge at some point, and this is my belief. So I feel like a lot of these companies, you can go long, you know, with private market. And that's exactly what Tiger's doing, right? They're doing a lot of, they have their hedge fund, but then they're doing a lot of private market. But they're able to get liquidity with the, so the pro ratas as well. Yeah. Um, but, you know, just the beauty of public, right? Um, even though sometimes it's not always as sexy as, you know, if you're up or down by the end of the day, you don't have to wait a decade, right. you know, and right. that's always good. Right. Well, I think being more like now investing my own capital and being more of like a retail day trader, mm -hmm. now options trader, which I'll get into that. Yeah. Even I've talked with my buddies at long, short hedge funds and, you know, they really spend a month or two months you know, finding opportunities and crafting yeah. a thesis and they make a big investment mm -hmm. in that company and they hold it until yeah. their, con until their thesis plays out or changes. Mm -hmm. So even then they're not going in and out of stocks yeah. at these long, short hedge funds, like daily or weekly, they might yeah. adjust their position monthly or quarterly. Yeah. And they might have to thoughtfully think through downside protection too. So when they're doing all this thesis stuff, they probably have some hedges to kind of make sure that they don't lose everything. I'm assuming. Yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So what ended up happening was, you know, end of 2020, beginning of 2021, I decided to take my profits and all these things. And this is, so I guess, oh, let me, I skipped a key point. Yeah. I went on a two month or six week Euro trip in 20, summer 2020 to Croatia to kite surf. And when my bosses told me they were opening the office back up, I was, and I had to come back to Miami and drive up to Boca Raton, Florida, which is a pretty quiet, boring place. Yeah. I just knew on the first week back in the office in September of 2020, like I, I think I even told my dad, I'm quitting my job by the end of 2021 is what I told him. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, okay, what am, how am I going to make money? What am I going to do? And my cousin, he went to YouTube in 2020 for a lot of his stock and finance. Yeah. Knowledge. So he ended up suggesting I start a stock and finance YouTube channel. I started that in November of 2020. It ended up growing quicker than I was expecting, which all this all ended up in me quitting my job on my 28th birthday on in February of this year, because the YouTube channel had grown to around 10,000 subscribers at that point. And when I did quit, I had thought based on the rate of growth and the money it was bringing in that by this point, I'd have 100,000 subscribers, be making probably 20 to 30K a month from YouTube and affiliated income sources. But what happened was literally a, a week after I quit my job, the market crashed. And yeah. because of that, YouTube viewership and growth slowed down because the 
person who goes to YouTube was most now going to LinkedIn. Yeah. The person who went to YouTube for their stock advice, they were most affected by the market crash yeah. and mo more afraid to invest. Sure. Um, but at this point, you know, part of my YouTube strategy was that I was, I am pretty transparent about my portfolio and my mm -hmm. trades. So because I wanted to make videos about things I owned, I started instead of taking concentrated bets like I did in 2020, put it in like 10 grand in like a bunch of SPACs, bunch of high growth stocks trading at crazy valuations. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, I was stuck holding the bag or I was stuck on like substantial losses on some of these positions yeah. by March of 2020. So then at that point, I'm like, one of my, I have a discord and one of my, Discord members were like, why don't you try selling options with the shares that you own? Because I owned thousands of shares of some of these stocks. So I could sell yeah. quite a bit of call option contracts. Mm -hmm. So basically what happened was in May of 2020, I started trading options and I started, I started buying options, realized that, that I lost quite a bit of money in May doing that, realized that's a little trickier than I expected. Then I started reading more about selling options and collecting income on yeah. you know shares that you own or selling mm -hmm. put options so kind of from july to october my strategy was collecting income on my stock portfolio by selling mm -hmm. call options and whatever cash i had if i found a good opportunity i would sell put options yeah. so this allowed me to generate income based on an asset that i owned which was the shares of these stocks so that got me more interested in options trading. And then as I started doing it more, I got approval from my brokerage to do more advanced option strategies, take a little riskier, do little riskier things. Yeah. So in the last kind of two months, I'm exploring other option strategies. And the beauty of options, right, is when you own shares, you only benefit if the shares go up. Mm -hmm. But there are option strategies where you can benefit if a stock goes up, trades sideways, or goes down, right? So yeah. right now, um, I've, I've been focused on learning those different strategies and employing them in my portfolio to generate, you know, a certain amount of monthly income that I want to generate as of right now. But I'm slowly actually planning on liquidating my stock portfolio in the next month because I, I started learning about trading options on futures contracts, which is much riskier, but you get a lot more leverage. That's why it's riskier, you know. Yeah. For example, for me right now to generate 10k a month in income on my stock portfolio i probably have to deploy you know four hundred thousand dollars in capital but yeah. with few, uh, trading options on futures to generate 10k a month on uh, i probably only have to put 30 to forty thousand of capital to work potentially yeah so there's that and then there's better tax treatment right because right now i pay short-term capital gains tax on every gain i make whereas if you're making gains on futures trading you pay no matter how long you hold it you pay 60% long-term capital gains tax and 40% short-term capital gains on the total gain. So that just makes more sense for me from a tax perspective as well. And from a, a margin or leverage standpoint, it's basically using the same option strategies, but now instead of trading stocks, you're trading the S&P 500 futures or the NASDAQ futures or oil futures, beef futures, whatever. So that's, what I, that's actually why I came home mostly to study for like a month straight um so i can just start using that strategy in 2021 and at the same time i've started diversifying into other investments i made my first vc investment last year uh that's yeah. sitting at a 4x return and they're doing another round i'm putting another good awesome. amount of money into work in that and then i invested in my first nft on sunday which one which one did you buy a bunch of my college buddies started an nft called blank souls okay that's so a really cool project um, that's awesome Ron Artest is actually a supporter of the project. He how, is much is the, uh, how much is the NFT? Did you buy it on OpenSea? Uh, I bought it. Uh, no, no, no. It's, it wasn't on the secondary market. I was, you minted, I minted it. it. I minted it. Oh, okay. Is so it too it, late to mint it now? What was that? Is it too late to mint it now? Did you get the... They, uh, they closed it last yeah. night. Yeah. So, so we're yeah. doing we're doing a holiday. I'm I'm going deep on like Web3 as well. We're doing a Christmas party and I partnered with this... Uh, this project that's actually minting that night at the holiday party. So, oh, um, nice. so yeah, so I've been, you know, and so that's just a really hot space and excited that you're getting into that too. And some of these people on this channel are actually 
uh, doing some research on Web3. Um, so talk to me a little bit on, because I've seen you on your show trade Ethereum as well. So just talk to me about maybe some high level learnings that you've had so far on just NFTs and Web3 and how do you find these NFTs? I think a lot of it is really through community and just word of mouth and just more of a private invite, right? Yeah, so I guess let's start. I a very my knowledge of crypto and NFTs is as basic as you can get, right? Yeah. But one of the beauties of you know going to the University of Chicago, working on Wall Street private equity is I have a big network of people that are smarter than me in general and just also more knowledgeable on certain sectors. Yeah. So I went big on crypto in 2017 without properly understanding it. And I, I lost some money in 2017. Mm -hmm. um, but last year, you know, my roommate from college is actually very high up at Gemini, second oh, biggest, wow. second biggest yeah. crypto exchange run. So by Gemini the is raising 400 million to invest in the metaverse. Um, Cause I think they just, <laughs> they, I didn't even they just don't that. want people to, yeah, yeah, dude, they raise like, they raise 400 million. They want to build their own metaverse. I think, that news came out when Facebook uh, changed their name to Meta. They're like, screw this. We are we are going to have our own Metaverse and people will use ours instead of Facebook's. Yeah. So anyway, he told me last October or September to put my whole portfolio in Bitcoin and Ethereum. And I obviously, for yeah. diversification, couldn't do that, you know, because sure. I knew I was leaving my job. But I put yeah. in a good amount in Bitcoin and Ethereum yeah. and I made a pretty good return on it. Mm -hmm. Um you know, this year, but I, I kind of yeah. slowly exited my position in Bitcoin just because I, I, as I'm getting better at options trading and futures trading, like mm -hmm. I'm more focused on of reducing my volatility and being able to generate uh, a certain amount of monthly alpha or, or yeah. income, right. Sure. So for me, I can't risk, but I had at one point 33% of my money in Bitcoin and Ethereum mm -hmm. sitting on good gains in both. So I sold yeah. out of Bitcoin, sold out of ethereum last week and my plan oh, sure. is to, i'm gonna get back in mm -hmm. if there's a you know a substantial dip again yeah. next year but i mean the right cool now, thing is you know ethereum even if you buy some of it right you need to use ethereum usually to invest in some of the nfts right so a lot of that is the currency yeah. there's some companies there's a company um that's using Solana, right? So, but you need to buy, and a lot of these to get them, you have to have Ethereum anyway. So if you buy Ethereum, you know, depending on the entry point you get in, in general, you know, it's around four grand, right? So if you get in, even even during the dip, at least Ethereum has some value. Um, but, you know, that's just the great thing about it. It's liquid, it's fractional, so you don't have to buy a whole Ethereum. So that's kind of really cool that, you know, you can't do today in securities. I think they do have some platforms where you can get fra fractional securities, but... In general, it's um, you know, it's it's much more fractionalized with with crypto. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, the the way the NFT investment came about mm -hmm. was my buddy. You know, one of the benefits of being active on social media, having the YouTube channel, is it allowed me to stay in touch with people from college who I haven't talked to in five to six years. Right? Yeah. Even if they're friends, you don't mm -hmm. you don't get to talk to a lot of your friends very often, especially because everyone's so busy. Yeah. So, Anyway, one of my really smart friends from U Chicago told me that he works at a pretty, he works at Bow Capital. Mm -hmm. It's a early stage, I think, VC firm based out of New York. Um, yeah. He told me, hey, man, we decided to launch an NFT. We're throwing a launch party in Miami. Because this, mm -hmm. this was Art Basel down here. So Art Basel, yeah. There you go big, out there? I did just go to his event. Yeah. There was a big crypto NFT crowd out here for three, four days. Sure. I went to the event and mm -hmm. before I know it, like some of the smartest people I was in, I knew from college were working on this NFT project with him Wow! and, and they told me more about it. And I obviously, I owned quite a bit of Facebook until recently. Um, I had, I have been reading all the hype about the metaverse and though I don't quite understand uh, as much as I should probably, I know that it's a real thing. There's a lot of money mm -hmm. to be made. And I knew yeah. people were making a ton of money in NFTs. So for me as an investor, I'm thinking, all right, obviously I have to get smarter on this, but if I'm ever going to get the conviction to invest in something as early stage and speculative as NFTs, you know, a big part of that decision was going to be based on who's back in the project, who's on the yeah. team. right? And I, I thought about it and I was like, this is as close as I'm going to get to having mm -hmm. 
you know, a connection with the, the founding team of an NFT. Yeah, you just won't, you won't even, you know, you have to really know somebody to even be able to get and to mint was, it. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. I was able to mint, like, I think there were only 1,200 originals minted, and I own a pretty decent percentage of that. Yeah. By decent, I probably mean like 5%, mm-hmm. or something like that. Yeah, sure. Uh, or a little less than five. But yeah, mm-hmm. I just started trading on the secondary market, I think today on Magic Eden. Mm-hmm. And the first one sold for, so I bought each one for two Solana. And yeah. the first one just sold for 4.8 Solana. That's great. So that's already a hundred. Yeah. I mean, there's some people that make, you know, I, there's some people that are in the business of just flipping JPEGs. And um, I've been kind of talking to some people in the community. And I mean, the guidance they, they've given me is like, look, you know, you just got to decide if that's what you want to do. You know, that's almost like day trading where right? you're kind of flipping the JPEGs. Um, so, you know, one thing that he was saying or some of the people I've been talking to is just look for real utility, um, you know, look for some real um, source of value. I think if you can use that currency in multiple mediums, right, you can you can go later on to the metaverse. A lot of these companies, too, they have the metaverse on their roadmap. So they have the coin, they have the token then they have these NFTs, but then later you can go into some metaverse at some point. Um, but, you know, what, what has been some advice that you've been given on NFTs besides just kind of, hey, knowing the right people? Anything else to think about? So I'm reading, I'm reading, they sent me a bunch of stuff to read up on mm-hmm. it. But it seems like, you know, the NFTs that will have staying power, right? Because yeah. there's, there's a lot of crap out there right mm-hmm. now, are the ones that kind of can bridge kind of the digital metaverse and have some connection to the physical real world, right? So the, yeah. the, the way this project is doing that is um, it's kind of playing on the interest of sneakerheads in the metaverse and specifically, you know, trying to onboard NBA players and generate buzz among NBA players for this project. So what they do is you mint one of the NFTs, it's called a blank soul. Mm-hmm. And it's basically like a digital blank white shoe, right? Yeah. And with that, they're going to send you a physical shoe as well. Right? Oh, nice. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. But what happens- yeah. You want to have utility. Some of these too, like what's really cool is um, to go to, I, I know in New York, to go to some of these parties, you have to have the NFT. So you get, right. you actually get like exclusive access, like especially the, th- the, the ones that do things with athletes and with musicians, like to get access, you actually have to be part of that club. Yeah. So that's what they're doing with this as well. Mm-hmm. That's why I run our test, Metal World Peace. He's on board with this project. And um, the owner of the Sacramento Kings is a backer of this project. And he's he's actually apparently going to gift one of these N- NFTs, the originals, to, to Chamath, who co-owns the Warriors, and Mark Cuban, yeah. who co-owns wow. the Mavericks. But this NFT is going to come with special like event access to like NBA All-Star Weekend 2022, yeah. other exclusive events. Mm-hmm. But the idea is they're going to onboard uh, artists and designers to create like a digital shoe and you can yeah. trade in your blank soul NFT for what's called a design soul from that real artist or creator. Wow. Right. So that's the idea that they're thinking. Mm-hmm. There's actually going to be a poker night and cocktail night in New York next Tuesday. I'll send you the details. Nice. I'll tell my friend, if you want to go, I'll tell him you're, you're interested in the metaverse and NFTs and you can, uh, you can get to know him. That would be great. And I'll invite him to my party too. You know, another thing is, uh, there, I forgot which rapper it was, but there's a rapper that's dropping an NFT. His whole album is an NFT, right? Because it's all digital media. So I, think, oh, yeah. I forgot which one it was. You I know, know Tory Lanez did that. Tory Lane, that's who it is. Yeah, Tory. Yeah. So his whole album. So, you know, I just think it's going to, there's going to be more and more, you know, files that are going to be a unique file that are, um, and then, you know, I don't know if you've been reading about DAOs, you know, but the whole constitution was, you know, bidding uh, against other auctioners on, on Sotheby's, right? So I think that just kind of opens up just a whole can of worms, which is other platforms that the community can build uh, versus having to, you know, be someone that's part of the, the, um, the centralized kind of community and, you know, the kind of the, the governance of like that blockchain kind of determine what happens, so... Yeah. Uh-huh. So like, you know, that was a pretty small percentage of my mm-hmm. capital though. So yeah. like, if it goes really well, like awesome. Most of my attention for the next kind of year is going to be focused on making money, trading options, futures contracts. 
yeah. until I, until I find something that piques my interest more because mm-hmm. YouTube is great and we're still posting content every day. Yeah. But yeah, kinda, so I think your cousin's posting some content too as he's well. He's kind of handling yeah. it for the next yeah. week too. Yeah. Um, you know, YouTube's YouTube's great, but I view it as more of like a way for me to educate and help people rather than like an income source. Yeah. So as of this, like right now, when I think of ROI on my time, like I just make so much more trading that it makes sense for me to like accumulate you know, a certain amount of capital and invest it and you know allocate time to YouTube as I have it. You know what I mean? Because yeah. what I'm really trying to get is a skill set because the real money in YouTube is selling courses yeah. to your subscriber base. So I'm really trying to get really good at options trading and options <laughs> on futures trading so I can create a course. There's not many, there's a lot of people, you know, selling courses on YouTube. There's a handful mm-hmm. of people selling options trading courses on YouTube. There's not many people trading courses. I mean, selling courses on how to trade options on futures. Oh, so interesting. What I'm, try- okay. what I'm trying to do is like carve out my niche mm-hmm. because, you know, with 20,000 subscribers, I, I could be making a lot of money if I had a quality source uh, course to sell people. Yeah. Right. But, you know, my mm-hmm. goal before was to just grow the channel by just turning out content like crazy. Now my goal is like, I'm OK if the channel grows more slowly because I'm not mm-hmm. relying on it for an income source. What I want to do is create a develop a skill set, create a quality course that I can sell to anyone interested in that type of trading strategy it's kind of yeah. how i'm thinking about the youtube strategy going forward and then i think mm-hmm. someone mentioned you know the fitness content that's really where kind of my passion and interest lies because, yeah you know three years ago you know i was fat and broke right and the second i started getting back in shape my mental health improved and once that was better then i could focus on all right how do i my yeah. career improved and then i could focus on how do i make more money and become a better investor. So I actually have my own fitness app coming out in. in oh, nice. Week. Yeah. Oh, I didn't like, know that. That's yeah, cool. yeah, it's coming out in the next three weeks. So I'm just filming okay. a bunch of videos for that. Yeah. Going to be posting more on my fitness Instagram page. We're kind of doing a lot of things right now. Yeah. Because let me know if I can help with that. I can push that out to our community as well. And what yeah, does yeah. it do? Does it does it the what is uh what are you building that's kind of unique with it? Is it like so I actually fitness goals. Yeah, no, I actually found a company that, you know, they, you, it's built off my brand and it's going to have some of my custom workouts on there, but, you know, people who follow me and are interested in, in kind of working out, um, they put in their goals in that app and it uses artificial intelligence yeah. to create a custom workout and diet plan based on their goals, mm-hmm. or they can choose to do my workout and diet plan. Sure. But it allows, it makes the fitness thing more scalable, right? Because I have, mm-hmm. I have, and have had high ticket clients mm-hmm. and that's, you know, at most I would take one or two of those a month. And even if I wanted to take more, it's like, I only have so much time in the day. To what are the it. goals of those clients? Are they trying to lose weight or are they trying to get ripped? I, or I mean, they trying to get... guy was trying to lose weight and get ripped. Yeah. And what's so, the biggest challenge? I mean, I think for me, my issue sometimes is uh, just eating late, you know? So I think for me, it's like mostly um, just diet and then sleep, you know, which I don't, I don't sleep that well, but, um, but you know, what, what, what are the biggest, and this is not like a weight loss commercial here. Yeah. Um, no, no results are guaranteed, but, but what, what do you think are the biggest issues? And, you know, what if people changed in their life to, uh, to kind of just get, get back in shape? Yeah, well, I would say the biggest thing for for most people, at least the people I've worked with, is they all exercise to some degree, whether it's two times a week or five times a week. So then it just a lot of it comes down to diet. And, you know, I if people I ask them, do you want to do more intuitive dieting? Because I personally have never kind of tracked a calorie or macro in my life. And that works more for me. Or do you want to take a more strict like calorie counting approach? And then you work back from there. Right. But the key thing is I feel like if people change their habits, Mm -hmm. that's half the battle in losing weight. So like when I was, when I lost a lot of weight last year, the key things I did were cut out alcohol out of my diet, cut out uh, maybe eight sweets once a week, instead of like four times a week, I stopped eating three hours before bed. Yeah. I stopped eating carbs at dinner, right? Little things Mm -hmm. like that really add up over the course of a few weeks. And if you compound that with, a very strict exercise program because I personally like working out a lot more than I like dieting or spending time. Yeah. In the 
So for me, making those little changes like led to a dramatic change in my physique over three months. Mm -hmm. So the big thing is just you got to identify what habits are kind of holding yeah. you back. And I would say, look, you know, I bought a treadmill like it's at my house, you know, so you, you can't get more lazier than that. Like if the treadmill is literally like in the middle of your house, but it's for me, it's kind of the motivation, right? Because I have the time, right? I could get up and go for a run, but sometimes it's really that motivation. Like, I guess to really get into the habit forming, I think, you know, I think you referenced the, um, the, uh, atomic habits book in the past, right? So it's really just yeah. kind of making that part of your ritual to say, no matter what, I'm going to hit it up, even if I'm not feeling it. And, you know, there, there was a, there's a video that motivated me with the rock, you know, rock gets up at 4am in the morning. And every time he feels like he doesn't want to work out, he looks himself in the mirror and he asks himself, are you a bad, you know, are you a bad yeah. mf -er? And I uh, just like hypes himself up, you know? So I feel like a lot of that is like, uh, getting your mental set, mental state, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like a key thing from that book and you know, you did it with the treadmill is to create a mm -hmm. new habit. You got to reduce friction, right? So yeah. you gotta make the habit as easy as possible. So for, for you, the fact that it's in your house makes it a little easier to work out. Yeah. Right? So for me in 2020, when I lost all that weight, I moved back to my parents' place because my building gym was closed. Miami was shut down. And I fortunately yeah. had a lot of time and I mm -hmm. had it at my parents' house. So I was able to work out two times a day without yeah. having to commute to the gym 40 minutes a day, right? 20 yeah. there, 20 back, which I do right now. So you have to make it as easy as possible. And then at the end of the day, right, it's hard to, it's hard to go from like, for example, one of my goals for 2022 is to wake up every day, seven days a week at 430 in the morning. Well, I could just wait until December 31st to start doing that. But right now I wake up at 7 a.m. or so every morning. I'm not just going to be able to flip a switch and wake up at 430 every day, January 1st. I'm slowly cutting back or waking up earlier, 15 minutes earlier every day going into January 1st. So that by January 1st, all right, my body's already used to waking up at 430, right? So yeah. you can't just make a new habit or break a bad habit overnight. You mm -hmm. got to really craft a well thought out plan to 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 tackle it is what i would yeah, say yeah sure well we're at time you know i feel like this hour flew by but um i want to open it up for any questions if anybody has any any of you guys have any questions about entrepreneurship about pe banking anything yeah whatever you know career yeah. any questions you have you can you know Send well, while the, while these guys are thinking about it, you know, I always ask one question. Um, just looking back, what's the biggest piece of advice that you received from, uh, you know, from a relative or a mentor? The biggest piece of advice I received from a relative or mentor. That's funny. Could a, just lot be. Of my, a lot of my mentors were, were in finance, right? So I always yeah. got great pieces of advice from mm -hmm. them on career stuff, right? Yeah. And private equity stuff. But, you know, in 2020, I started reading a lot of personal development content from guys like Tony Robbins, David Goggins, his book, Can't Hurt Me. I think he's what really changed my life. Really? And my okay. mindset. Yeah, everyone, I, I, 20 people at least read that book after I recommended it. They all shot yeah. me a message saying it was just like, it changed their life. Wow, Can't, okay. Can't Hurt Me by David yeah. Goggins. I've heard that some stuff was, good. I've heard some good stuff about that book. So that is probably the best book I've ever read. Mm -hmm. um, and it will just change your mindset. Yeah. Right. But the key thing for me is once I learned about those guys, right, I realized that I was actually like a pretty privileged individual and um, I was in a good spot for my age. But sometimes you compare yourself to other people and other people's yeah. journeys. And I think reading that book helped me just realize that I have it good and I can accomplish anything I want to mm -hmm. accomplish if I'm willing to work harder than any, than other people. Right. Yeah. Um, so I'd recommend that book, but the key thing I think for me was like finding your passion, right? What do you, mm -hmm. what do you wake up every day and like want to do if you had all the money in the world, right? Which I don't have, but I have enough where I can do this entrepreneurship thing. You know, I'm not like, sleeping on the floor as I try to start up a business, which yeah. probably takes some of the pressure off of mm -hmm. me. But, you know, I was worried for a long time. I would never find my passion or what I love doing because I knew it wasn't private equity and investment banking. I liked private equity a lot. Yeah. If I had to work a job for another person and I, I got, I had carried interest in the fund. Mm -hmm. I was making a lot of money, but 
I would have made a lot of money over 10 years. Right. Yeah. And I didn't want to look back when I was deciding in 2020, what do I do? Like, do I stay in private equity or do I try to find my passion in my hobbies? Like try to make money doing something I love. Right. Because being an athlete for a long time, that was one of the reasons I was so jealous of athletes and entertainers because I felt like they were waking up every day and just doing what they loved and getting paid a lot for it. Yeah. I wanted to do that as well. So private equity for me was like, I didn't wake up every day super pumped to go into work and build LBO models, right? It was a fun job because mm-hmm. you meet cool entrepreneurs, you invest in interesting companies. But for me, like once I found out that I like making content and I wanted that freedom and flexibility to travel and work from anywhere in the world, because I do travel a lot, that's what I realized my passion was, right? Making content and traveling the world and I do now have more of an interest in trading public equities. I'll never go work for a hedge fund or somebody else unless I blow through my own money and I have to. But my number one piece of advice for everyone I talk to, especially people under the age of 30, is like try to find your passion. And the only way you'll find your passion is if you put yourself out there and try new things. Because I know when I got on Instagram and was posting fitness content, some people probably thought it was funny. Some people were like, who is this guy? Like, what does this guy think he's doing? you know, trying to, I wasn't trying to be a fitness influencer. I was just sharing the yeah. time. Uh, or I know when I started the YouTube channel, I had guys that I hadn't talked to in years from college, call me out when like some of my investments were doing poorly, even though I was yeah. sitting on like a 80% return, they probably like, I invested a lot of money in plug power because retail investors love that. And I wanted yeah. to make YouTube videos about that. Sure. So I lost like $20,000 on plug power. And I have people I haven't talked to from college in years calling me out on Instagram, like tagging. Yeah. Well, there's always going to be a lot of haters, you know I mean? People right. that just look, right. they're definitely following your content. If you, they use, you know, those people, even though they're hating on you, they're, they're following your content. So, right. So the key thing is like, once you put yourself out there yeah. in order to try new things and find your mm-hmm. passion, you're always going to polarize some people. Some people are going to love you and some people are going to yeah. hate content right sure and you gotta be you gotta be okay with that because i think growing up you know i i don't say i was a people pleaser but i was always well liked by everybody and a lot of that yeah. was i was a more quiet and reserved individual i didn't put myself out there right mm-hmm. yeah. but once i put myself out there if i never did that i wouldn't have realized i like making content i like investing in public equities and if i never realized those two things i wouldn't be doing the entrepreneur thing right now i'd still be in private yeah. equity you know Sure. Uh, Danny, you got like one or two more minutes? Yeah, yeah, I do. I'm, oh, I'm yeah, who's the other question? It was it Ife? Hey, yeah, yeah, I've got a question. Yeah. Sure. Hey, Daniel, thanks a lot for that. I was really, really, really like, thought provoking, and you know, you were really candid with your responses. And and for me personally, we actually have I have a very similar sort of trajectory to you, just like some years behind in terms of age and stuff. My question for you is like, I know you you mentioned that on your 28th birthday you transitioned you, you said all right i'm quitting my job my 28th it, enough's enough i want to what i want to know from you is like what sort of went into that that decision to, to go and and just you know take that leap you know besides and that's probably a bit of a personal question in terms of like how comfortable were you financially to be able to do that like what what, what were the things in your life at the time i guess that allowed you to be able to make that transition um yeah and make that for sure. and feel comfortable doing it yeah for sure so i'll say like for starters right i was i'm single and don't have i don't have kids i'm single so the only real person i'm responsible for taking care of is myself that made things a little easier right second you know i don't have too much i'm talking about i'm covering the finances first you know, I don't have too many liabilities or expenses, so I don't need to be making that much monthly income to to live my life, right? That was number two. But then three, you know, I had from working five years in investment banking and private equity, you know, saved up a de- enough money where like I wouldn't have to work for like five to seven years and I could live my current lifestyle. And I knew I had a skill set for, I knew I had a skill set where even if my portfolio doesn't grow ever again, I'll be able to make, you know, 15 to 20,000 a month trading options. So I felt com- I felt like I was in a good financial spot to go out into the unknown and not get that stable paycheck coming in. So that's what I would say. Like, it would be very different, right? If I was 28, had 
a lot, like when I was 28, I had about half a million saved up and invested. Right. So that gave me the confidence to know that I can do this entrepreneurship thing for two to three years and see how it goes. And worst case, I, you know, had a great education and great work experience to fall back on. We're like, I could, I could stop this today and go get a job at a fortune 500 company in corporate finance, probably paying me six figures a year. Or I could start applying for MBAs and probably get into like a top 10 MBA program. So I knew there were options if this didn't work out. Right. But one thing I never had was that pressure that like I quit my job and I'm potentially not going to be able to pay the bills or be starving. So I always tell younger people who tell me they want to potentially get into entrepreneurship or pursue their passion, work really hard for like a couple of years, save as much money as you can. And right, there's there's three things to creating wealth, right? Increase your income or your top line, like a company, cut your expenses to save more or improve your profitability. And then three, invest your money and make more money. So well, as I was 28, I just evaluated all of those things and said, okay, every, actually I wake up every week and I'm like, how do I increase my top line? What are my expenses? Are they getting out of hand? All right. There's the hobbies I have, the trips I go on. Like they do, I do spend quite a bit of money sometimes. And then three, how, how much is my portfolio? What, what's my portfolio value? How was my monthly return going? How much money am I making? I know as long as those metrics are at certain levels, like I'm okay doing what I'm doing right now indefinitely. But obviously like I can't go like, you know, if I had a girlfriend, I'd have to adjust the expenses as needed. You know what I mean? Cut it by half. <laughs> or if I have to buy a house, I have to factor all that in, right? Like I don't plan on buying a house or making any big purchases anytime soon. But like, those are all things that have to go into your calculus as you make these kind of big changes, right? Yeah. But at the end of the day, worst case scenario, I'm 35, blow through all my money. I can still go back to the workforce. And worst case, yeah, I'm, I'm behind five to seven years. But at least I didn't want to have that feeling at 35. What if I gave this a shot? What if because people have done incredible things in two to three years, right? Like, yeah. I feel yeah. like people sure. and I... I've read this before. People always overestimate what they can accomplish in one year, but they underestimate what they can accomplish in like two to four years. Right. Yeah. So for me, it's like, I didn't want to be 35, be making a ton of money in private equity and wonder, Oh, what if at 28, you made the decision to go all in on YouTube or the fitness thing. And at the end of the day, another exercise that really helped me was this guy, Dan Locke has this book, how to make F you money. And this was actually one of my first YouTube videos. One of the exercises he recommends doing is map out your dream lifestyle and how much it would cost you a month, right? So I said, okay, like if I wanted to live that really lavish materialistic lifestyle, how much would it cost me a month? And the math ended up coming out to $50,000 a month. So then I'm sitting there like $50,000 a month. Why am I out here trying to make $3 million a year in private equity? $50,000 a month is 600 K a year. Like if I work really hard on my own business for three to five years, I'm very confident that I could make 600 K a year and, you know, be able to spend 50,000 a month with, which I would never do now that I think about it. But yeah. that was my, like, I would recommend everyone, you know, because we get so caught up in the rat race and making money, especially when I was living in New York and comparing myself to my U Chicago friends, some of whom were making like three, 400 K right out of college. I'm like, you get caught up in that race, right? When I realized every year I wasn't getting happier, even though I was making more money and my hours were getting better, my happiness was actually decreasing. That's when I knew that for me, money wasn't the answer for me. I want to live a certain type of lifestyle and I don't need to make as much money as I used to think I did to do that. Yeah. So that's just some of the advice I would say, as you're thinking about, transitioning to entrepreneurship leaving your career you should kind of factor in yeah yeah that's a great answer man. thanks that was really helpful um i think there was one more question danny if you got it and then i'll let you go i know you're super busy um so i think somebody asked where where they should go to study um obviously you know so plug for danny his youtube channel you do have a subscription right so you can get some courses through some of your lectures right 
Yeah, so I do private videos for YouTube yeah. members on options trading. That's a $9.99. There's a $9.99 month a tier yeah. uh, to be a YouTube member. But mm -hmm. to start, so, you know, I'll put this book in the group chat right now. So there's the rookie option strategies that I, if you want to get into trading options, and remember to trade one options contract, you need to at least own 100 shares. Well, 100 shares is equal to one options contract. So the most basic risk, I wouldn't say risk-free, but least risky strategy is selling what's called a covered call or selling a cash secured put. Uh, I'm going to put this book in the, in the chat. I'd highly recommend you guys start with this option strategy. If you're invested in public equities and you want to try to generate an extra 2% a month on your portfolio or on that position. Um, mm -hmm. It's called covered calls for beginners. I think that's the right link. Hopefully that works. Um, cool. Yeah, that works. And then from there, I'm going to put another website in here that has a lot of good uh, free knowledge on options trading called the options playbook. These have, you know, it has rookie strategies, more advanced strategies, and then more risky strategies. I will say once I started doing the very risky strategies in October and November, I did lose some money, so I wouldn't jump right into those. Um, but there's what's the beauty of options trading is you have neutral strategies, right? Where if the market moves sideways, which, you know, if you trade within two standard deviations mm -hmm. of, of where the market trades on average, you're going to make money most of the time. There's strategies that are neutral, right? So mm -hmm. remember, people are saying the stock market's obviously not going to have a banner year like it did this year. It might kind of trade in that kind of six to 10 percent range or you might get a six to 10 percent return on the s p next year which means hopefully the market will be much less volatile and with that sideways action you can make a lot of money if you learn some of these neutral options trading strategies like iron condors butterfly spreads and vertical spreads so i highly if you're in, if you're invested in public equities i think options trading will change the game for you and I tell people, especially a lot of younger guys who hit me up, like if you are able to save up kind of 200K to a quarter mil and you get good at options trading, like you can generate five to 10K a month in income, right? So my strategy now is I try to generate 15 to 20K a month. I withdraw five to 10 a month to cover my expenses. Um, and that allows me to keep going as I slowly build the YouTube channel, as I slowly build this fitness app and figure out like, where do I really want to take this, right? Because yeah. I know I'm going to have to, like, pick one eventually if I really want it to grow a ton. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, that's great. Well, hey, Danny, hope you have a good time with the family and hope you have good holidays and uh, catch up soon. Thanks for all, thanks for all your uh, mentorship and storytelling. No problem. Thanks for having me on. Good meeting everybody. You can hit me up on IG if you have any more questions. And, uh, yeah, thanks and hope you all have a great day. Yeah, take care. Bye, guys.